in California. Uh, and he's mainly working on integrating next generation sequence data to understand and characterize functional SNPs associated with risk in human cancers and analyzing and interpreting human epigenomic data, specifically aberrant DNA methylation associated with human cancers. So I think it would be a very nice talk, and thank you very much for coming. It was a very late invitation, and it's nice that you attended. So thank you. And thank you. Okay, bon dia, and thank you, Leticia, for the introduction, and thank you, the organizers, for inviting me to this uh, advanced school in functional genomics. So, as Leticia said, yeah, I uh, did most of my work in, in the United States and California. Um, uh, where I did my grad undergraduates at UCLA, and then my PhD, my postdoc at University of Southern California, Los Angeles, where I focused mostly on characterizing or identifying putative functional elements associated with particular cancers. And in this talk today, I'll talk to you mostly about uh, the, the analysis that we did by integrating these next generation sequencing data with the GWAS and 1000 genomes associated with breast cancer. I always like to, to begin my talks by acknowledging some of the key people that are involved in, in, in this research. It's not only uh, one person that does this, obviously we know there's a, a lot of collaborative work and my, my former PI, Jared Cotzier, was the one who uh, spearheaded um, the environment and allowed us to cultivate sort of our ideas and our research. And, uh, and so his contribution to this is significant in the sense that he provided the funding. <laughs> uh, and, and Sun uh, is a PhD student who just recently graduated last week. Uh, so that's great. So a lot of the work that I'll be presenting will be work that we've done in collaboration with Sun. Uh, Simon Kotsia, who is uh, actually the same last name as Jerry Kotsia because they are related, the father and son. And uh, J Simon is now uh, here in Brazil as my research associate, and he's helping me build my bioinformatic and epigenomics lab. So I'm very happy to have him here as well. And Sean Lee is a, a molecular biologist technician who some of the, the functional studies that I'll show you at the end was done mostly by her. So as, as I said, I, I work mostly at the University of Southern California, the Epigenome Center. And my, our co-collaborators were Charlie Nicolet, uh, who's the director of the Epigenome Sequencing Center, and my, my former PhD advisor, Peter Laird. Um, so let me uh, give you a, a kind of a brief aim and objective of the study. Uh, the idea was really to see whether we can characterize open chromatin regions associated with putative enhancer elements in non-coding regions of the genome of breast epithelial cells in cancer cell lines. So can we identify, using these two different types of cells, all the regions in the genome that are open and, and accessible for regulation? And then once we have all that information, can we then integrate this information with previously known breast cancer risk regions identified by genome-wide association studies in order to review functional risk regions associated with breast cancer? So today I'm going to, uh, there's a lot of uh, topics that I'm going to be covering, so I think I'm going to give you guys a kind of a brief introduction to some of the terminologies. I'm, I'm quite sure many of you are familiar with it, but as those who are not, it will be a good kind of uh, introduction to those terminologies. I want to give, go delve really into the motivation of the study, and then this sort of ties in with the, 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 some of the problems that were previously associated with the GWAS studies. And this is not a, a, a misspelling here. Um, actually, you know, the, the, a lot of people have cr criticized the genome-wide association studies. They, that's in millions and millions of dollars and, and have came up with very little uh, uh, results that can actually define driver events in certain cancers. But what I, I will show you is that we will be able to sort of resolve the, the discrepancies with the GWAS studies with some of these new uh, data that are being generated from next generation sequencing. So I'm gonna, the, the results will be divided in two major parts. Uh, as I said, I'm going to present to you some of the, uh, the open chromatin regions that we found in breast cancer cell lines, and then a bioinformatic tool that we developed uh, to help us integrate this information with the GWAS studies and, 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 and all the known variants in the human population to identify uh, unknown or, or, or novel risk-associated regions that may be associated with biological function. 
OK, so uh, is an, an introduction to how the, how the DNA in the genome itself is sort of organized. We know that the DNA here in gold is organized in, in, in each of our cell nucleus. Uh, and it's helped and assisted by these large glomular proteins called histones. They're made up of four large molecule glomular proteins, H3, H4, H2AB, H2B. Uh, these things can then glomerize together and form this, this, this histone octamer, which then allows for the DNA to wrap around it. And it, it allows for both organizations of the genome so that it can be nicely organized inside the, uh, inside the nucleus. Um, as well as provide a context for regulation and, and transcription for, for associated genes. So there are, are, are differentiated marks that, that can happen within not only the protein itself, the, the octomers, I mean uh, the histone, uh, as, as depicted here, but we can also have modifications on the DNA itself. Uh, and these are not sequence-based modifications, these are sort of modifications on top of it, and, and this is all in the, in the era of, of epigenomics and epigenetics. So we get DNA methylation modifications, and then we also have histone modifications. And then these two events can then help understand the, the openness or the close uh, part of, of the genome that may be associated with um, regulation of transcription. So this led to lots of studies uh, in, in the late 2000s where they, they've mo uh, identified and profiled all the different histone marks. So we've got the H3K4. So this is looking at the H3 histone complex at the lysine 4, and then there are several types of modifications that can occur, monomethylation or trimethylation, and it has been shown that uh, trimethylation events are generally associated uh, to genes that are prone for activation or can be active in transcription, as well as uh, events on the lysine 27, which then can also provide context for repression. So if you had trimethylation of K12, K4, Generally, those associated genes are, are active, and if there's K27 at those promoters, those are generally repressed. So we've, we were able to profile all these different types of histone marks, not we, but you know, as, a, as a collective whole as scientists, scientists all around the world, we're able to now understand the organization of, of the, the genome and also the context of these modifications that can occur that can then relate to how genes are then expressed and regulated. And this led to a... Um, a a huge national consortium, uh, actually an international consortium, uh, that uh, is called ENCODE, so it's the en Encyclopedia of, of Coding DNA Elements, um, and this was uh, a consortium of more than 100 scientists from all over the world, and they recently uh, uh, finalized their, their publication about six months ago now in a series of articles in Nature Science and Genome Biology Research where they profiled all the different histone marks as well as RNA sequencing and, and so forth, uh, across a multitude of different cell lines, popular cell lines that are currently used in the laboratory, um, as well as uh, um, novel cell lines or primary tissues in, in some cases. And, and the, the effort was, as I told you, was, oops, was to uh, profile all these different um, events, all these different modifications in the histone, as well as looking at the transcriptome. And sorry. Uh, so they, they profiled the RNA sequencing uh, across a multitude of these cell lines, giving you an idea of the transcript variations across all the different transcripts that are known and unknown. Um, they did uh, computational predictions using uh, computational tools and also followed that up by validation with RT-PCR. And they did also chip sequencing to identify uh, specific transcription factors or uh, different kinds of proteins that bind to DNA and then they profiled those things across the entire genome, and as well as they, they did what we call DNA-seq and FairSec. Uh, this is uh, uh, rather interesting for our research and our interest is because what this allows you to do is to profile uh, the genome which are either open or closed uh, by, by, by definition of, of um, having the state of, of activation or prone for activation. So these elements, and I'll describe to you exactly how these things work in a, in a couple minutes, but these events, uh, the, these types of sequencing followed by DNA's hypersensitive sites or fair sequencing allows you to profile regions that are open that can be defined as those that are cis-regulatory, very proximal to the transcription start sites. So these are generally what we call the promoter elements. And then also can profile these long-range elements either in cis to the associated transcript or in trans if you were to think of 
trans activating effects from different chromosomes to to acting on on, a, on another set of chromosomes. Um, and then that's what leads leads to 3C and 5C, where you can actually find the interaction between the different chromosome states. And then all of this stuff is then integratively analyzed. Um, to give you a context of regulations in these non-coding elements. So for this study in particular, we looked at uh, characterizing uh, breast cancer. Uh, we, we used uh, human mammillary epithelial cells. These are primary tissues, uh, generally passage between one and three, and they're called HMEC. Uh, these are ER negative, and this is sort of a histological profiling of what they look like. Uh, and we also received some uh, cancer cell lines, and these were derived from a patient. Uh, but again, these are cell lines, so they've been immortalized, and the, the fact that they are cancer, we can passage them for many, many times. Um, and a lot of people are using this type of cell line, including the ENCODE. And so we, we take these two sets of cells, these groups of cells, as our uh, cancer cell for breast cancer, and then the HMEC as our normal cancer, our normal uh, cell for breast cancer, or for breast tissues. So, uh, we were very interested in looking at these non-coding elements and trying to identify putative enhancer elements. So we, we, we uh, stuck with uh, FAIR-SEC. Uh, and FAIR generally stands for formaldehyde-assisted isolation of regulatory elements, or FAIR. And the way it works is, is very similar to chip sequencing, but instead of using an antibody to pull down a transcription factor or protein-binding uh, element, they, uh, they would do cross-linking and then they would shear the, the DNA and the protein complex, so the, D, the protein and DNA are bound to each other, but then there are these elements of DNA that are not bound by, D, uh, by protein, and then you, you perform uh, phenylchloroform extraction, so you get your protein DNA complex com in a pellet, and then the supernatant is your free form of DNA. And then you take that, and you can do site-specific PCR and next-generation sequencing. And of course, you're going to need a reference, and the reference in this case Instead of using cross-linking with formaldehyde, you just you don't cross-link and you do every all, all the other steps. So then you get a pool of all your DNA uh, elements, bound or unbound, um, that or, or that was previously known to be bound or unbound, and then use that as your reference and you compare the two sequencing profiles. So uh, formaldehyde uh, assisted isolation of regulatory elements allows you to to identify, and it's been shown in in, in recent publications that. It's generally more prone for the intron, exons, and non-promoter intergenic regions, um, as opposed to DNA's hypersensitive sites, which has been shown to be more focused on the promoter elements. So uh, the results for, for our uh, um, FAIR data using the HMEC normal cells and the cancer cells, what we have identified when we were calling peaks, and the calling peaks for, for FAIR is very similar to chip sequencing. It's got a very focal peak here, and it tells you, and they could be broad or, 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 or narrow, um, and so generally any, any of the peak calling methods out there, you will be able to identify these regions, or you can just profile the raw data. But what we found was that the vast majority of the normal cells, as well as the MDMD-231 cell, uh, the, the FAIR, or the open elements that we, we believe to be uh, open using this FAIR technique, are generally in, uh, in uh, outside of the promoter elements. So about 8% of the fares reside within 2KB of a known canonical transcription start site, and the rest of them are in what we think of as putative enhancer elements. Uh, and they are divided up by uh, half of which are, are within entrons, um, and then the other half, or a little bit more than the other half, are in these intergenic non-coding elements, these kind of gene desert regions. Uh, and, and we get the same, approximately about the same profile with the cancer cells as, as well as the HMA. Uh, so these three panels here are just representative elements of, of, of the data. So in green is our normal uh, cell, red is our uh, cancer cell, and this is looking at chromosome 5, the Q arm of, of 11.2. And you can see that we have uh, regions that are open in one cell type, in this case in the normal but uh, relatively closed in the cancer cell. And we also have a gain or, an, or a new open element in the cancer, and it wasn't apparent in a normal. We also have elements that are in common between the two. So it's, there's no change uh, between the two different types of cells. And then we also have a loss of, of these open elements in the cancer cells compared to the normal cells. And so in, in these, these VIN diagrams here, just a summary, this is just looking at a representative elements in, the, in, the, in, in different parts of the genome, but this is sort of summarizing the, the results. 
if we look only at those promoter elements of transcription start site, we find that the vast majority, 73% of the normals and 50% of the cancers overlap with each other. We just take the coordinates as, as, as a ballpark uh, idea of overlap. Um, but what, when you look at, at uh, the putative enhancer, so that all of these other uh, uh, non-promoter elements, we see that the, the number, the percent, drops significantly. It's about 30% or 40% of these two uh, cell types are in common with each other. So there's a vast majority of peaks in the cancer that are either gained or lost, in this case gained, compared to the HMET. And then the HMET contains a set of its own. So this was pretty interesting. This was very nice for us to see. And it le led us to believe that in these cancer cells, they are, their genome is quite differently organized and, and are, are accessible differently than uh, the normal tissues. Um, so as I said, the ENCODE has deposited all this data and, and they profiled this across a multitude of different cell lines, popular cell lines that people use. And one of them that they, they, they used was the HMEC cells. So we were able to then pull in those HMEC data from uh, the ENCODE. Uh, and what I'm showing you here are, are, are our fair peak that are all of our fair peak data. So this is looking at all, in red or is the profile of our HMEC data uh, um, total. So regardless of whether it's in the promoter and the enhancer. And if you were to, to center all of our peaks to those that are open, that, so these are all the peaks and the, the chip sequencing data profile from the ENCODE. And the DNA hypersensitive sites, as I told you, those are uh, very similar to FAIR, uh, but it's just a different experiment, but it identifies uh, open regions in the genome. And we find that our data overlaps significantly with the DNA's hypersensitive size profile by ENCODE. So that was very reassuring for us that our data that we are observing coincides with an independent uh, experiment and an independent laboratory um, and, and using pretty much the same cell types. Uh, so red is our data, and you can't really see it, but Gray is our background or our expected uh, um, profile, and that was done basically by uh, doing a, a thousand permutations, random permutations across the entire genome, and then looking, profiling the distribution of those random permutations, uh, and then and then this is basically profile here. So you you can't really see it, but it's a flat line here, and then you get a very sharp peak right right here for our fair data. Now, CTCF is another very important transcription factor that defines the, the elements of these, these uh, genomic regions, these large contig regions that either are bound to the nuclear lamina or not. And this has been shown to be very important for regulation of certain genes. And it was nice to see that our data, uh, the FAIR data sets that we are observing in these HMEX cells, overlap significantly with, our, with these CTCF data, chip sequencing data that was performed using HMEX. Now, what's also quite interesting is if you were to look at all of these other histone marks. Now, we didn't profile any of these other histone marks. Uh, but again, as I told you, the ENCODE looked at this in the same cell line that we looked at. And we just basically looked at the, at the profile of our FAIR data to these other elements. So if you were to focus your attention on H3K4 trimethylation, remember I told you the H3K4 trimethylations are those that are prone for, that are generally associated with the promoters and that they are responsible uh, they are generally associated with repression of the associated genes. I'm sorry, the activation of the associated gene. And what you're seeing here is that the ones that the FAIR data that are within the transcription start site are uh, in, uh, enriched at these H4K3 uh, uh, methylated uh, histone marks at the promoters. But you can see that there's a sharp dip right at the center of the peak. And then there are these humps on either side. And that represents the neighboring nucleosomes. So remember, the, the nucleosomes are dynamic, and, and what we are profiling is an average profile of the histone marks. And, what, and in this case, the spare data that we are identifying are these open elements, and the nucleosomes are on either side of this profile. Okay? And then we'll, so you see this in the transcription start side, but you don't see this within the enhancer or in the total set. So that was really nice to show that the fair data is really specific. Uh, it's, it's not specific to the promoters, and it's it's more specific to the enhancers because if you look at the monomethylated, which are known to be involved in, in enhancer elements, we see a huge enrichment of our fair data at these uh, at these elements. Okay. Okay. So that was sort of the first part of, of the of the analysis that I told you about. We were looking profiling the, the chip sequencing data, looking identifying these open chromatin regions in cancer and and, and normal tissues. 
And now I'm going to discuss uh, an approach that we, we attempted to do to identify and associate these elements that we identified to be associated with risk. Um, and, and to give you sort of a background on, on single nucleotide polymorphisms, we know that there are uh, chromosomal homologous crossing over recombination events that, can, that are created as a mosaic of a parental chromosomes and gametes during meiosis. And these LD blocks, or these linkage disequilibrium blocks, are, are stretches of DNA that segregate in a population. So one very good example of a linkage disequilibrium block are genes, canonical genes. Um, any of these important genes that are important for uh, uh, us as humans uh, are, are, are blocks of DNA that can then segregate in the population. Um, but then there are other elements or there are other variants in the population, uh, also known as single nucleotide polymorphism, that vary among each of us in, 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 in the different populations. And we know from, from previous studies that about 10 million of these in humans uh, are, are at a 10% minor allele frequency or greater. So these tags tend to be single nucleotide polymorphisms that vary across the population. As I said, these were profiled by the, this large consortium, the 1000 Genome Project, which went out to sequence the genomes of a large number of people, provided comprehensive resource on human genetic variation. They found that uh, they, they, they used 2,500 unidentified people from 25 different populations and identified a pool of about 30 to 50 million single nucleotide polymorphisms. And, and this led, in, in sort of in conjunction with the 1000 genomes, uh, there were these vast studies, uh, large consortium studies that looked at uh, associating these variants within the population and, and not only to look at, uh, you know, ethnicity and, and, and environmental influences, but also to categorize people either with certain diseases or with, with very complex phenotypes or even with just even normal phenotypes with I mean, height or hair, hair color or eye color and so forth. And what they, they, were, they did is they, they had a, a large cohort of uh, samples that are your test set and then they have your control set, uh, so that's the test control, case control studies. And what they would do is then they would profile all of those variations um, and then they will find associations within those significant polymorphisms that may be associated with certain events. So these are identifying markers that can be used to predict, in this case, individual disease risk and highlighting the molecular pathways underlying the disease providing potential targets for therapy. That was a major goal. So uh, this is a, a figure I'm sure many of you guys may have seen or, or heard of. Uh, this is done in 2011. So these are, these are the entire genomes, these are chromosomes laid out here, um, and uh, each of these little lollipops are the variations in the population, or in this case that are associated or been identified to be associated with a particular phenotype. Um, again, they could be a normal phenotype or a disease phenotype, uh, and they've identified over 1,449 regions of the genome displaying replicated associations with more than 237 common diseases or complex traits. And you can see it's it, it, Vastly distributed across the entire genome, and certain and, and some of the diseases contain more than one uh, associated element, um, and some of them contain one or a, a very few uh, associated elements. Now, if you were to take that data as we've done and and looked at all those single nucleotide polymorphisms that were identified for for diseases, in this case we're specifically looking for cancer, and we then ask the question, how are they distributed across the entire genome? Uh, and, and, and where do they overlap? Are they more associated? Are they more overlapping uh, in the genetic region, intronic promoters, or uh, the coding region? And what we found was that for almost all the tumor types, uh, they were vast, the vast majority of them, more than 90% of all the identified GWAS studies, are in these intergenic or non coding elements. Um, and and, and this, this is what uh, it led to a lot of criticism for the GWAS studies where they spent millions and millions of dollars in the studies and they said, wow, we were, we were hoping to find a gene, a mutated gene or some kind of driver event that can define a certain disease and you didn't find it. And what you found were all these, these SNPs that are in these non-coding elements and, and outside of these coding uh, regions. So what does that mean? So, uh, uh, and, and, and this was done, you know, during a time where sequencing was just starting to pick up, but it wasn't very affordable for, for the vast uh, studies. 
And so the, the problem at that time was that the disease associated SNPs and many of these thousands, uh, th these were done mostly in, in screening chip design. So these were pre screen uh, microarray chips and SNP chip arrays. And they didn't really have a good sense of the entire variation. They didn't, weren't able to pull in all of those variations that are now known uh, to be uh, populated throughout the entire population. And that's, that's about 20 or 30 million known SNPs. At that time, they only had about a million, and then they had two million SNPs, but it wasn't capturing all of the ones that they, that they should have been capturing. So they're missing a lot of information. And we also know that these LD blocks define large regions, often as large as 100 kb. And so the functional cause of the SNPs as well as risk mechanisms are difficult to identify. So it's, although they, they find these little targeted regions, they, they can't just assume that that is the element of, of, of driver. It could be spanning a large context that might be segregating in the population. Okay, so our question was, how can we narrow down these regions to make them more am amenable to biochemical mechanistic analysis to define disease risk more precisely? So this is sort of our working hypothesis, and this is some, something that a lot of people are, are thinking about right now. You know, tag versus driver versus function versus causal driver snips. And so here's just a, a, a contig of, of the DNA. Um, and, and the genome, and these blocks here are what we consider these LD blocks. These are um, uh, the black ones here represents correlation. So we, we show contigs or regions that are segregating within a population. So in in the earlier days of, of GWAS, they, they would have uh, SNPs peppered throughout the entire genome, but it wasn't capturing all the, the, the candidate SNPs uh, for that study. So what they found was one region here that was highly associated for a particular disease or for a particular cancer. Now, that region may not be the actual driver event or causal event, as, as they have shown, because it's in these non-coding elements. But if you were to grasp and, and identify these large LD blocks that may be segregating with this identified tag SNP, then we can go in and say, well, maybe the functional SNPs are not generally that one that they have identified in the GWAS, but it might be these neighboring ones, either upstream or downstream of the, of the uh, identified tag SNPs. And these blue ones, then we'll, we call them the, the potential functional, the putative functional SNP. And then from there, we can get to causal driver. But of course, going from here to here is very challenging. We have a lot of different uh, animal studies and, 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 and very directed functional studies to identify causal. But at least we can, at this point, we believe we can get to function and we can identify elements in the genome that may confer that, that putative functional element. So, uh, so our hypothesis is that the functional risk SNPs for breast cancer reside within these regula regulatory elements. Um, there's a lot of recent papers out there that have shown that linkage to these associations with a variety of different regulatory information are, 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 are spanning these non-coding elements and not generally right there at those coding regions that a lot of people have thought of. So what we decided to do was, well, let's take our data, uh, the, the, the FAIR sequencing data that we know defines these candidate open chromatin regions, and these are generally, as I, as I showed you earlier, are defined in these uh, non-coding intergenic regions. Now, can we use the GWAS studies and the 1,000 genomes, which has now been identifying all these different SNPs in the entire genome, can we then use all this data, integrate it, and try to find the causal functional SNP um, by overlapping all these features? So we, 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 then we created a tool called Funky SNP. It's an R bioconductor tool integrating functional non-coding data sets with genetic association studies to identify candidate regulatory SNPs. Uh, it's an R package, so you can download it freely. Um, use it with your own data set, if you like, to, to identify functional uh, SNPs. Uh, and the results, uh, the, the, the idea is that it would take these large uh, sequencing um, data sets and then the, all the pools of, of the 1,000 genomes. Oh, this is probably better, huh? <laughs> um, um, and then it would reduce that complexity, that the, the reduce the number of candidate SNPs down to a reasonable number from 10,000 to, to hundreds or, or tens that, that are then functionally uh, active, or it could be functional. And I'll show you an example of this. So again, this is what we're doing. We're going, we're, we, we now know that there are 20 to 30 million SNPs genome-wide. We have information from the GWAS studies of a region of interest uh, for a particular disease or, or a phenotype. And now we can then take a window around that 
overlap that with these um, other data sets, next generation sequencing data like FAIR data or, or open chromosome region or histone marks, and then identify linkage. So we're going to see if any of these SNPs that overlap a feature, how well they link to the tag SNP, and then that may define the uh, the function itself. Okay, so for breast cancer, there are uh, currently there's 26 known GWAS tag SNPs, uh, and and this is the distribution of where they're they're they're, they're almost in every single chromosome. Um, these have all been shown in a variety of different studies to be highly associated for breast cancer, and you can see that the vast actually you can't see it, but as I showed you in the previous slide, uh, the vast majority of the SNPs are in these intergenic regions or intronic regions for particular genes. So we take that data, so we got 26 uh, uh, GWAS studies associated with breast cancer. And then we also, as I told you, we also have these sequencing data, not only the ones that we generated from our own lab that identified FAIR elements, these regulatory elements, but we also can pull in, use from the, these large consortiums like the ENCODE or even the roadmap, uh, uh, histone marks. So these are the different histone marks that I told you that can define certain elements. Uh, in this case, the trimethylation defines promoters. The, the dimethylation defines both promoters and enhancers. Monomethylation defines enhancer elements. And these K914 acetylation can define open chromatin regions. And 27 acetylation defines sort of active and engaged enhancers. So we take all this data, along with our own FAIR data that we have, comparing normal versus uh, uh, cancer, and we integrate that. So we got these, these 13 biofeatures here. Um, uh, from, for our cancer data set, we had um, acetylation, uh, H3K9 and 14 acetylation chip sequencing data that was generated in our own lab that I didn't show you, but it's uh, data that, that we have. Uh, I showed you the FAIR data al already, and we also generated some uh, dimethylated uh, K4, H3K4 dimethylated uh, histone marks. Um, and then we have all of these normal sequencing or normal data. Uh, uh, sequencing data on normal tissues. Okay, so we got these two different data sets, and we run it through our tool. So the tool takes each of those tag SNPs, as I told you, uh, the GWAS tag SNPs. It defines a window. It's an, uh, a B, by default, it's 200 KB around each of the tag SNPs. Um, you can define it in the package. It'll extract. It'll go to the 1,000 genomes, and it'll extract all the the known SNPs for that, as well as the the race. Um, the location as well as the, uh, the frequency of that particular SNP in that population. Um, it takes all that information, it takes in then your, your genomic features, so it'll take all 13 of these genomic features into this uh, tool, and then it'll find the overlap with all the 1,000 genome SNPs within that window with these different features, and then it'll calculate uh, uh, the R-square, which is the linkage uh, uh, linkage between your tag SNP, in this case the GWAS tag SNPs, with those candidate functional SNPs um, that overlap these different features. And it will just continue to do that until it goes through all 26 uh, GWAS tag SNPs. So what we ended up going from, we went from 26 risk loci uh, and then centering that and then identifying uh, a window of 200 KB around each of those, we identified 71,000 SNPs that are in linkage disequilibrium at an R squared greater than 0.5. Uh, if we were to reduce this, we, um, then we can reduce this by coinciding these uh, 71,000 SNPs with one or more of those biofeatures, so one of those histone marks, okay? And we reduce that down to now 381. If we incorporate four or more biofeatures, we then reduce this from 381 to 98. And if we take five or more biofeatures, we reduce this down even further to 46 candidate SNPs. So what we're really looking at are those low-hanging fruits, those ones that, that have a, a SNP that is in linkage to the, the tag SNP um, that overlaps a variety of different genomic features. Okay, so this is sort of a, a summary result. This is a circus plot. Each of these are the, the candidate uh, GWAS tag SNPs and the associated uh, window around it. Uh, the red is the cancer and the green is the HMAC normal cells. And you can't really tease anything out of this, uh, but this is sort of summary of, of this and what we're seeing here our, um, our tag SNPs here, those are the 26 tag SNPs on the x-axis and on the y-axis are the different features that we looked at, those 13 biofeatures that define the different elements in the chromosome. Uh, and the, the cells, the, the cells here represent the number of tag candidate SNPs that was pulled in at an R squared of greater than 0.5 um, here. So 
Uh, the color codes here represents zero represents no SNPs that are in LD to these tag SNPs that overlap any of these features. And as you get higher and higher to red, you get a lot more candidate functional SNPs. And what we found was that there are a, a, a very high number of uh, tag SNPs here, about three or four of them, that overlap uh, that, that, that the linked uh, SNP um, to these tag SNPs overlap a number of different features as, as indicative, indicative here. And then we also have another group of, of uh, candidate tag SNPs that overlap a significant number of uh, candidate potential SNPs that overlap a, a, a number of different features here as well. Uh, we also found that if we if we were to profile those those number of SNPs um, um, and, and compare that to backgrounds, so the number of peaks in risk regions divided by the number of peaks in the total genome, we found that there are hotspots in the genome that are highly enriched for these, these elements, uh, and in particular the AQ24, which is a, known to be a very large gene desert region. Uh, we we uh, consider this to be an enhancer nursery, which is Enrich for all of these very interesting elements, these open chromatin elements as I described earlier. And so the vast majority of these these ones here that, that I'm showing you are actually on the AQ24 region. Okay, so uh, what did we do then? Well, well now we've, we've got a candidate set of SNPs. We had at that point we had about 46 candidate SNPs. Uh, we, we ranked it by R squared, and, and there's an associated p-value, and we took the top uh, 13 uh, enhancer elements, um, and we then did a functional study where we cloned these elements into a reporter assay and then and threw it into a cell. Uh, here's our control. Uh, these are an luciferous activity to look at the enhancer potential. Uh, and, and the yellow line here represents that, that average of these three controls. And the BF1, BF2, BF3, these are the, uh, the breast cancer functional elements that we, we decided to study, uh, the 13 here. Of those 13, 12 of them uh, validated by enhancer activity, uh, both uh, introduced in, in the HMEX cell as well as in the cancer. And we also found that some of these enhancer elements are more active in the cancer than it is in the normal tissue, and we also have it vice versa, where we have uh, it's more active in the enhancer, but then it's diminished in the uh, in the cancer. So that it's active in the normal and then diminished in the cancer cell. And this is just a representative of this BF6 here. I'm going to just highlight just one of these uh, studies that we we followed up with. Uh, so this is our BF6 element. Uh, these are all the different sequencing data that we've, we we pulled in, both from the encode and from our own data. And you can see that there's a very distinct profile here where we have uh, monomethylated DNA histone marks that are depleted here in this region. We have this histone HMEC uh, FAIR data that is open both by FAIR and by DNA's hypersensitive site. And then we, and then in the cancer cell, we have the FAIR uh, element, but it's it's devoid of this enhancer activity. Um, and so we, we believe that this may be very important for, for this biology, for, for this particular cancer. And so what we did was, so this is the tag SNP, and this is our BF6 element, and these are the three candidate SNPs uh, from the 1000 genome that's been linked to this particular tag SNP. And we did uh, sequencing, targeted sequencing for, those, for these uh, risk regions here in the BF6, both for input data and for our FAIR data, uh, and what we found was the predominantly the, the 353 and the 810. I'm going to just describe the last three numbers here. The, the 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 second allele, in this case, the risk allele, actually jumps up in the fair data as as compared to the input. So the input has uh, has has the non-risk allele, but in the fair data, it actually contains the risk allele. And this was identified here in in a, in, in a, in a linkage plot showing you the non-risk allele and the risk allele. And what we did is then we then took uh, each of these three candidate functional SNPs uh, and then commuted the, uh, uh, the allele for each of them and then looked at the enhancer activity. And what we found was the enhancer activity diminished considerably when you put in the risk allele compared to the non-risk allele, both for the, the, the normal cell and for the cancer cell. So this was very reassuring. This was sort of a kind of a proof of principle of, OK, I'm almost done. And so this led to uh, our, um, our model that we, we are predicted for all the functional elements, uh, in particular for this one, BF6, 
So we, we believe that there's this functional element downstream or upstream of, of a tumor suppressor gene. It's, it may be in cysts, it may not be in cysts, um, but we believe that it's, uh, what it's doing, it's, it's acting on the tumor suppressor, it's overexpressing this, this gene in a normal cell, and then, and, and then for someone who has the risk for this cancer, the allele uh, will, will, will disrupt this activity of this enhanced element, thereby, uh, thereby the expression of this tumor suppressor may not be as high, or, or, or it could just be uh, deregulated in some fashion, and that can then lead possibly to the tumor itself, that we believe. Well, so in summary, we, we, uh, what I showed you today was um, um, a summary of distinct open chromatin features that were identified both in cancer cell lines and, and, and in normal cells, and that are, uh, that are distinct mostly in the cancer cells and that are present in non-coding regions. Uh, I, I shared with you a tool that we developed called Funky SNP that we use to integrate the uh, open chromatin features of these enhancer elements uh, in cancer cells and then integrate that with the GWAS studies and we identified 381 novel breast cancer risk correlated SNPs coinciding with one or more, 46 coinciding with five or more of these chromatin bio features of enhancers. Uh, 12 of the 13 that we, we studied uh, uh, proved to be a, an, enhan an active enhancer where the uh, SNP resides and we're calling it YAF, yet another functional SNP. A lot of people are now looking at it and funky. We are finding another one, yet another one. Um, and, and I showed you here this BF6 as an example of, of, of among these 12 that resides in this enhancer nursery region, this AQ24.21 region is defined as a biologically functional enhancer in breast cancer cells and its activity is different among cell types. Um, and so these are the two different risk, novel risk SNPs that we've identified uh, that resides in the BF6 and that it, it retains a little differential nucleosome depletion and enhancer activity. And the non-risk allele of the enhancer had a higher enhancer activity, more pronounced nucleosome depletion, indicating that in this case, a tumor suppressor target is associated with breast cancer risk. So now, now the next step is really how do you, and I'm not going to go into what we're going to do, but obviously once you've identified these functional elements, you've got to now think about how you want to uh, continue this to really confirm whether this is really a, 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 a functional uh, element or a causal element. So you can do a variety of different experiments at this point. You can do 3C, 4C, which would then allow you to identify uh, interactions between different chromosomes. You know, as I told you, we don't know whether the, where the tumor suppressor is, or if there is a, a tumor suppressor, or if there is a collection of genes that are being regulated by this enhancer. So you can use 3C, 4C to find this out. You can do EQTOL, which allows you to identify associations with the candidate SNPs along with an associated gene expression. So if you believe that there are these candidate expressions, uh, genes there um, that may be regulated by the function of these candidate SNPs, then you can look at the homozygous, heterozygous, and homozygous uh, dominant, and then see if there's a profile like this, a linear correlation, to show you this one risk allele that actually provides an expression, or it can go in the opposite direction in the case of, of this BF6 element that we looked at. And then there's this new technique called Talon. Uh, I'm not very familiar with it, but it's, uh, it's uh, and we're just starting to experiment with this, this uh, protocol, where it allows you to do site-directed mutation. In this case, we can then uh, uh, knock out or, or remove that one risk allele that we believe is important for that element, and then we can introduce this into a transgenic mouse, for example, or, or then you can do RNA and, and then look at um, genome-wide what are the, the disruptions for that, and then you can associate that with, uh, with this particular uh, risk. Okay, so future experiments, as I said, we're looking into doing 3C sequencing to find the target gene of enhancers and then do EQ2L um, and, and, and do a variety of different uh, analysis at the transcription factor binding because these, fact these elements um, are, are defined by transcription factors that bind to it. So now we're very interested in looking to see whether we can identify these transcription factors that may actually regulate these, these elements. Um, and that might help us to then do epidemiological studies and we can then see whether um, there is room for treatment for these patients. Okay, so that's it. Uh, in a nutshell, again, I want to thank all the people that contributed to this and, and, and to, to thank my, my former PI for the opportunity to, to do this kind of informatic, integrative analysis. So, thank you. Okay, we have time for some uh, questions. Uh, I have one 
maybe start question. Is this uh, 1,000 human genome project, all the data are available now? We, we can go there and take uh, what we want? Yeah, what, yeah. What, how, how yeah, generally these large consortium, the, the idea is that they would, uh, uh, they'll, they'll set up these grants with these, these large funding agencies and they say that in the contract that you, the data that you generate should be made publicly available to, to everyone around the world. So uh, the raw sequencing data may not be, I, I can't remember if the raw sequencing data is, but the, the SNP information, the frequency, and the allele uh, of, of each of those information are available and you can pull that down easily. Uh, thanks for the talk, very nice talk. And uh, uh, it looks like a very powerful approach to identify risk factors and probably to uh, foresee some uh, future treatments for cancer and other kind of cases. Uh, however, I have several questions. Uh, one of the question is uh, most of the rational is based on this, uh, the concept of uh, histone code. And uh, you, you know that uh, there's a kind of challenge concept like some uh, authors who uh, <coughs> favor the barcode, uh, which we use in the histone variation bar variants and uh, other modifications. So the histone code is a kind of a challenge for a couple of, year, couple of years. So I'd like your opinion about that. And, uh, uh, and also the, the data, they um, address the modification in histone 3 in the acetylation and uh, methylation, but there are uh, other markers. So what do you think if you use all the markers, like you know, histone variants or ubiquitination or, or phosphorylation versus your data, you would have uh, it, the same or probably uh, you, you could you know, correlate you know, both. That, that's one thing. The, the other question is, uh, about the the identification of transcription factors in the enhancers. So you, you in the last slide or one of the last slides you you put that as perspectives. But you make a, a luciferase assays of the enhancers. So based on those constructs you could predict transcription factors. So could you tell us uh, uh, about that? And um, I think that that's it. Can your remember, if I can remember your questions, I'll try to answer them. Uh, okay, so I think the first question was about the histone code, and uh, well, yeah, obviously the, the histone code is there's some controversies to that. It's the, the modification, the epigenetic modifications. You have to put this in the context of the cell type and the cell tissues, and so there are the, the histone code can, it, the general idea, uh, and as I said in the talk that these are generally associated with activation or not activation. We find that, in, in, for example, in stem cells, we have bivalent marks that define, uh, is a completely different idea than what we had thought about in the histone code. We have these two different types of histone modifications that are then associated with transcription, which is what we didn't expect it to see in a differentiated cell. So yeah, the, the histone code uh, varies, and, 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 but it's, you, and so, uh, and, and so yeah, there, Definitely, you have to put this in the context of the cell type, I think, and, and that would help you. Uh, I think the last question, I'll try to get to that one. It's probably easier to answer right now. So the transcription factor, uh, well, it, it's hard to look at just one element in DNA sequencing and then say if there's a transcription motif in that one region. What I like to do is take a collection of, of sequences that, are, that define an enhancer element. So in this case, what I was describing as a perspective is to uh, not to look at these functional enhancer elements, but to look at all of these candidate elements uh, that I showed you in the first part of the talk, and then take them as a whole, and then look and, and identify either known motifs that might be enriched in there, or perform de novo motif analysis. And I have a, just one more question. And uh, is possible to uh, mix uh, such analysis in the tissue for patients? How how you see that? Primary, you mean the primary, primary, yeah, tissue? primary cell, uh, the tissue itself, like the, take a biopsy for breast cancer. Uh, for yeah, breast this, is cancer. A, this is a big challenge right now. And so to do chip sequencing on primary tissue, it's it's a challenge, and a lot of 
A lot of people are working on this right now. I know people at USC is trying to do this and to get, and I think that would be a very important thing because what we are dealing with right now are just cell cultured cells, uh, and so <laughs> you, you and, and to do chip sequencing, sometimes you need a lot of DNA, so you need to collect and expand these cells to get enough of it to do, you know, chromatin IP and stuff. So that's sort of the challenge that we're faced with. Uh, the, the people can do uh, whole genome sequencing, exome sequencing, and that's that's fine because you just need very little DNA and you can just amplify that. It's not a big deal. Um, so yeah, it, 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 I think that that would be very interesting to get to the primary tissue and you know just to personalize this information. So what the, what we are trying to do here is just generalize the information and and then we can go back and then confirm this in either culture cells or primary tissues and animal models. So, yeah. And then you had a second question in between. I forgot that. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Great. <laughs> More questions? Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, the the uh, the um, discovery of uh, BF six allele rich is um, important to uh, use for diagnostic research. Mm. It could be. Yeah, I mean, like also, a, a identifier in diagnostic for breast cancer or, or predicted the risk from yeah. the breast okay, cancer. So, so the GWAS studies already did that. So they found that, that you know, the one, that red, that's, that's associated with breast cancer. So people can use this and say, okay, this is... What we are trying to do is trying to get to the biology, trying to understand the, the functional and causal element that defines this risk region that people are looking at. Because people have done GWAS studies and they thought, we're going to find that driver. We're going to find that gene that defines this cancer. And they couldn't find it. So what we are proposing is that you're looking at the wrong place. Our, our idea is that you, 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 you were focused because of the, the time, the technology at that time. was we didn't, we didn't have the throughput that we have right now. But they've already, they needed to do this study. So they spent millions and millions of do dollars, and, but they only used these microarrays or these chips or they did very low sequencing and they couldn't capture all the variations. So, but now they do have this information. They have the 1,000 genome. They, we see all these variations. We have the allele frequencies in, throughout the population. And now we also have the taxnips. So what we're saying is that the taxnips defining this region, there are these large contigs that may segregate uh, with this, this taxnip. But because we, we know that this is not the functional one because it doesn't define you know, uh, any gene, we feel like there's something else there. So what you can do then is, the idea is to do targeted therapy on this region. We can then now, if we can identify the motif of the transcription factor for that, or if we can def generalize the enhancer element that may active on on a particular gene that may deregulate this tumor suppressor that may lead to the cancer, we can then design drugs if we know what those are. So to be very tailored specific. Again, the, this stuff, but also think about this too. The the the, the GWAS studies actually. Uh, it, it, although they found it to be associated with cancer and breast cancer, it's not 100%. You know, so who don't have this or have it, it doesn't generally mean that they will have the cancer. So there's other events that need to go into play that can then derive this. So that's why we think that there is some kind of enhancer uh, element that may be deregulated in the context of development. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. Very much. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. So now we will move to, from epigenetics to metagenomics, epigenomics to metagenomics. Uh, Letice will present the next speaker. So the next speaker is Fabiano Thompson. So his background is in ocean oceanology, oceanography, and he did his PhD in Belgium, and now he has he's a prof he's a professor in our university, in the Institute of Biology. And uh, he's also a professor of many different post-graduation programs in diversity, in genetics, in computational modeling, bioinformatics, and many things. He has also led uh, the marine biology department. And uh, he, he was also the research director of the biology institute. And he's a visitant professor in the San Diego University in the US. Uh, and he has experience in microbiology with emphasis in taxonomy. And he's uh, mainly working in this micro marine microbiology, and especially with vibrio species, he's working. And I think that somehow he's like a pioneer in the university working with NGS. 
technologies. So he has many different machines in his lab. So I think that he probably has many interesting things to tell us. And we're just trying to do something on him. Sorry, just a few minutes to, to put uh, the presentation.
you, Fabian. Uh, I, I don't know what uh, is like that. Tem que ser com o microfone. Ok. É... Não, não, não tem problema. Então, é... então, primeiramente, gostaria de agradecer o convite. É uma honra a gente poder participar dessa iniciativa. E... Deixa eu ver aqui como é que a gente coloca aqui a nossa primeira, primeira slide. Não, exato. Vou te botar. Obrigado. Deve ser o pointer. É, ok. Muito obrigado pela apresentação, Letícia. E, pessoal, gostaria de propor que a gente fizesse algo bem informal. Daqui para frente eu vou falar em inglês em respeito ao nosso colegas, tem que ser em inglês, né? É, daqui para frente eu vou falar em inglês, em respeito aos nossos colegas, que devem estar ouvindo, pelo menos um. É, então, por favor, tenham paciência com o meu assento. Ele já é carregado, que é um assento atípico aqui. Né? É, e, em inglês vocês podem imaginar que ele é mais carregado ainda. Então, se vocês não entenderem, vocês me parem, levante a mão, é, façam uma intervenção. Então, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be part of this team and uh, push forward uh, genomics uh, in Brazil. Uh, thanks for the invitation, Professor Paulo, uh, his team, uh, Leticia, Wanda, thanks a lot for the invitation. We work at uh, the Institute of Biology. And um, what I'm going to present to you today are some aspects of our research in the Blue Amazon. Do you know what is the Blue Amazon? Yes, no, yes, no, some yes, some no. Okay, yes. Um, yep, so, okay, it's... Ah, tem que apontar para lá. Okay. Right. So this is the size of our house. A few days ago, I was in a CIEP asking for the school kids the size of their house. This is the size of our house, the blue Amazon and our huge country and huge challenges. The blue Amazon is this area in blue. 4.3 square million kilometers surrounding our country. It's, uh, of course, full of oil, and uh, this has attracted a lot, a lot of interest. But uh, let's be honest, that's the very boring part of the Blue Amazon. The Blue Amazon is also rich in biodiversity and by resources. And uh, this is what I would like to convince you, the importance, the ecologic importance of the Blue Amazon. At the same time that we own the right to explore the Blue Amazon, we also have a lot of uh, responsibility concerning the conservation of the Blue Amazon. And uh, throughout the presentation, I will show you some of our activities concerning uh, microbial diverse characterization 
uh, marine conservation. Our crew is spread all over the blue Amazon. We are doing research in the Amazonia, in the inner Amazonia, the green Amazonia, São Peter, São Paulo, Fernando de Noronha, Trindade, Abrolhos, Rio de Janeiro, of course, São Paulo, and uh, um, yep, de baixo. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks. So we are going to have a quick tour in the Abrolhos Bank. Uh, do you know Abrolhos Bank? Yes, no, yes, 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 no. So you you come from different parts of Brazil, from abroad, from Bahia, or someone from Bahia, from from Rio, yeah. So this is the um, this is the Abrolhos Bank. This is the continental shelf, very narrow, north of the bank, very narrow, south to the bank, and uh, this bank has around. 300 kilometers, 250 kilometers. This bank is connected to Trindade by a chain of mountains. Trindade used to be from the British, we got back without war. Uh, and uh, yeah, so the Abrolhos Bank is crucial for the health of the whole South Atlantic. And why? Because it's a uh, Huge nursery place. If you go there in August, September, October, you will see hundreds of whales that go there to raise their babies simply because it's a protected area and uh, it has also plenty of food. But it's also a house of microbes and uh, infectious disease. Uh, here you see a picture of a typical chapeirão, a mushroom-like reef. This is a unique structure. You, know, you don't find such a structure in other corner of the world, just here in Brazil, as much as the corals that uh, build this structure. They are endemic from Brazil, and they are relics from the tertiary period. These corals, they form these chaperones, which look like gigantic mushrooms, can be up to 20 meters high. And during the low tide, you can walk on these chaperones. Most of these chaperones, they are built by Mrs. Milha, Rispida, and Brasiliensis. Um, Mrs. Milha Brasiliensis, is this uh, brain coral, which is unique from Bahia. Unique. It occurs only in Bahia. This, do you have an idea of uh, the diameter of this colony you saw in the quick video, Alison? Do you have an idea of the diameter? Someone? Diameter. One meter, yes, can be even two meters. Yeah, it can be even two meters. So it's really impressive structure, and and it's rather old. Yeah. But uh, in the recent times, from 2005 onwards, especially. A huge effort by a group of researchers from different locations of Brazil has recognized a very big threat for the corals. Coral infection, coral diseases. And what we see here is a black band, the uh, exposed skeleton on the left, on the right, the healthy tissue. In this picture, we see a uh, skeleton already with a secondary colonization by algae, streptophytes, chlorophytes. This is very scary because these corals, 
they are disappearing. They are disappearing because of core infection, because of microbial infection. And uh, it's connected in a larger scale, possibly due to the management of the reef systems. And of course, as biologists, as oceanographers, we have to pay attention about uh, what's going on there and um, activities that uh, are going there. Just a detail for you on the structure of a coral. This is a polyp. One polyp, two, third, fourth. And this is a detail. You see the external portion of the polyp is recovered by mucus. And uh, this mucus is very attractive for microbes. Millions of microbes live in association with this uh, mucus. This uh, the gastrodermal cavity is also full of microbes. Microbes and even the skeleton is full of microbes. I would like to go back in time with you, like a decade ago, and uh, bring to your attention this uh, study we did uh, in 2003 with our colleagues from Tel Aviv. And uh, there, we recognized a widespread, very infectious pathogen called uh, Coralilithicus. Coralilithicus is a well-known pathogen now due to a series of studies that I'm going to share with you. So we found this microbe and here in Brazil, associated with the uh, mass mortality of larvae, of bivalve larvae in south of Brazil, we found it in associated with mass mortality of corals in Hawaii, in Australia, and uh, in the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. This coral is Spostylopora dummicornis. It hates Vibrio coralilithicus. So we have here Spostylopora dummicornis, healthy Spostylopora dummicornis uh, after uh, exposure to four and seven and fourteen days of exposure to coralilithicus. Coralilithicus was inoculated in the water of the aquarium and uh, it caused this massive tissue necrosis. It not only interfered with the uh, photosynthesis of zooxanthella, but it also uh, caused tissue necrosis of the coral, irreversible. So first possibly bleaching and then tissue necrosis. This microbe can also cause disease to a wide variety of uh, marine life and to even other types of animals, not so popular ones like the Drosophila, Artemia, Symbiodinium. So it has a huge pathogenic potential. And uh, by 2008, everyone thought that uh, the pathogenicity, capacity of this microbe was due to one gene, one single gene, the VCPA gene, which codes for a uh, zinc metalloprotease. The zinc metalloprotease would be responsible for the photosynthesis inhibition and uh, by and uh, um, responsible for the disease. Well, as we know, life is not so simple. And uh, we set to 
study the um, genome and the proteome of this uh, uh, Vibrio coralilithicus. We mutate the VCPA by allylic exchange and uh, we supposed that we would attenuate this microbe. This microbe would become harmless. And uh, guess what? What we see here is the white type and the, the mutant. The two have the same pathogenicity uh, level. So the mutant was not attenuated by the single mutation in that gene. There was something else going on. And then by uh, two-dimensional uh, proteome analysis, we recognized actually that there were clear differences between white type P1 and the VCPA. So there are proteins that are expressed in the uh, white type that are not expressed in the mutant and vice versa. And that was very striking for us. And those proteins are secreted by the pathogen in the culture media. So then this wonderful girl, she came and she said, I found the answer. Actually, yeah, actually the white type or actually the mutant does not express anymore the zinc metalloprotease as we expected. But it does express other types of zinc metalloprotease, type B and type C. Type B and type C zinc metalloprotease. Duplicates of uh, same toxin, which are not expressed in the white type. Duplicates that are in the same genome, of course, and are uh, silent in the white type. There are other 17 toxins that uh, this single microbe expresses to cause disease, to cause massive mortality of corals. And uh, you can take a look at the, in detail in the publications in uh, 2011. I would like to go through a few questions, answers concerning the uh, the occurrence and abundance and diversity of vibrios in the Abrolhos Bank. First, are these vibrios associated with corals pathogenic and abundant uh, in the Abrolhos Bank? That's the first question. What do you think? Yes or no? Yes, no, yes, no. Yeah, so this is what I'm going to try to convince you that they are abundant and that they are pathogenic. Uh, just to show you, this is our lab. This is our lab. Not mine, from the students. I have to stay here, the Fundão, but they enjoy very much there. The Santa Barbara Island, right? Um, just a bit more detailed view of the lab. You see some space here. Yeah, there is some space left there. It's uh, for the UFRJ to set up the first national lab for uh, coral reef research, which is approved by the Navy. It's going to be here. We don't need to run there to bring corals to the aquarium anymore, to the Institute of Biology. We will be there in the middle of the ocean. 80 kilometers of the coast. So trying to answer the question, are fibers abundant? Yeah, 10 to the power 6 CFU per milliliter of mucus and different species occur, including those that are listed here, including coralilithicus. So coralilithicus is present in the mucus of health and diseased corals. Health and diseased corals. It's, uh, they live together, naturally, but some imbalances can cause and can uh, 
induce disease. Uh, do they cause disease? Yeah, so if, if we take different strains from different groups here and we inoculate in the model organism, we recognize disease. So we take uh, representatives from each group and uh, we do bioassays and we recognize the high mortality up to 100%. So they are abundant and they kill the model organisms in the lab. Two other questions to address. So, Mucis milia, does Mucis milia have a core microbiome, a stable core microbiome that allows Mucis milia to uh, reach a homeostasis sta uh, stage? That's one question. What do you think? Do we have a stable microbiome? that helps us to fight disease and to digest our uh, nutrients. And yes, yeah, the plants have yes. So, and uh, are vibrios abundant in this uh, core microbiome, in these uh, organisms? What we set to do, we obtained Mucis milia brasiliensis, Mucis milia heart, Mucis milia Hispida, the three species that form this genus. You, can, you have seeds here. You, one. So, these three species, three species, what's the major difference between these three species? Phenotypically, you can easily tell them apart. Mucis milia uh, brasiliensis, the one that uh, Paulo Bich. Uh, correctly point out, can form very big colonies, but it has very small polyps. On the other hand, Mucis milia hispida forms smaller colonies, but has bigger polyps. Yeah, Paulo Bich has been in Abrolho several times. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's by the feeling. So, uh, the other thing, Brasiliensis is located only in Bahia and uh, Hispida is located from uh, Natal down to Santa Catarina. It's a right, rather huge <laughs> uh, biogeographic distribution. And finally, Harty has these long conspicuous polyps, like cup-like polyps. We did uh, the microbial characterization of the different species by a metagenomic approach sequencing the V6 region. And then, uh, so, uh, we, it seems that I, I'm missing a slide. So here, uh, uh, sorry, here we have the major groups. Uh, the alphas, of course, which play a key role in uh, uh, what do alpha bacteria do for plants? Alison, this is Rhizobium is similar. They fix nitrogen. They fix nitrogen. Yeah. Who? Any? Como é que é o nome? Zé Pedro. So, what do you think, Zé Pedro, about the role of uh, the alpha proteobacteria in the corals? Yeah. 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 So. Yeah, yeah, totally correct, Zé Pedro, totally correct. And this uh, symbiotic relationship expands to other groups, like uh, antibiotic producing bacteria that live normally in the corals and produce antibiotics. And uh, in vibrios, which also may produce an, uh, antagonistic uh, compounds, and the symbiodinium. Um, 
So the other group, which is key, is cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria. So between this, uh, what we find is a core of uh, around 40 species. Uh, gentlemen, can you put the next slide? Take a look there. Is there is a pie uh, Venn diagram? Venn diagram. Anyway, so it's not appearing there. Uh, it's there, but uh, if you depois tudo bem. So just think about there is a core. I can uh, if you are curious, I can show you later this slide. This is, should be there, but uh, it's not coming up in here in the presentation. There is a core of around 40 species in the healthy corals, which are the sentinels for coral health. And uh, on the other hand, for the diseased corals, there is an increase on this uh, consortia. There is an increase for this consortia. Uh, telling us that uh, this is corals. Something is happening to make the corals unstable. So we have this uh, increase in vibrios, sulfate, and iromonadacea, which is our a known coral pathogen also. But then, what could you tell me, Zé Pedro, about the sulfate reducers? So, the presence of sulfate reducers in the corals, it's possibly uh, the formation of a highly anoxic fermenting, a very anoxic uh, environment promoting very rapid coral degradation. That's, that's the idea. So, in the beginning I told you, yes, what about ammonia? We will... Uh, it, it may, it may, May, but pay attention. In the Abrolhos Bank, the ammonia concentration is so high compared with other reefs. It's at least 10 times higher if you compare with the Pacific uh, coral reefs, Abrolhos Bank, uh, or the Australian reefs. The concentration of nutrients in the Abrolhos Bank is much higher. The corals have adapted to deal with nutrients and sedimentation, which is unique from our reefs. In the other place, if you go to Japan or to Australia, it's like uh, clean water, 30 meters visibility. Um, so first I told you that uh, Coralilithicus was the uh, causative agent of uh, tissue necrosis. And it was one gene. And then we advanced the knowledge and we said, no, maybe 17 genes, different protease, different zinc metal proteases. But now the, the picture is becoming more complex. Perhaps there is a consortia that is causing the white plague. What do you think? Is it possible? Is, does it make sense? So we have this increase of these types. And uh, more and more, we are facing polymicrobial infectious diseases. This is what I want to convince you next. So the answer here is yes. It is uh, possibly it's a polymicrobial uh, infection. So we went back to Abrolhos. We went back to Abrolhos, and um, we sampled here the Santa Barbara Island site and the uh, Sebast uh, Sebastião Gomes site. Very close, 15 kilometers of the coast, 75, around 75 kilometers of the coast. And we looked for corals with a white plague. So these areas are... Uh, 
demarking imaginary lines that uh, um, demark the national park, marine protected area. Okay. We took the coral, we ground the coral, we extracted uh, DNA of the coral tissue. And, and uh, these are the first results. So what you see here, you see a clear increase. So the healthy and the diseased, you see an increase of vibrios and other types of microbes. This is uh, comparing many samples from different sites by metagenomics, by random sequence of uh, uh, coral DNA, microbial DNA. So let's go a bit further and um, take a look at the uh, Eux composition, because there could be even other players in this uh, white plague. And, uh, of course, there is a lot of Cnidaria sequence, because we sequenced uh, the metagenome of the coral. But there are also very primitive protozoa. And uh, the algae, streptophyta, chlorophyta, uh, that uh, give that uh, color, color for the coral. And uh, Uh, we also find uh, uh, abundance of, uh, although it's not uh, different, but we also find the sequence of uh, fungi. So we find fungi, we find protozoa, we find other types of microbes, possibly making even more complex the uh, infection process. So I hope I have uh, convinced you that uh, white plague uh, disease is not simple. It's a very complex uh, phenomenon. And um, the, the next thing I would like to address with you is uh, about uh, the effect of marine protected areas in uh, coral reef systems functioning. As I mentioned to you, some of the um, reefs of the Abrolhos Bank, they are within protected areas. And some reefs are outside the protected areas. So these reefs are within the protected areas. And these reefs in Chibabas are within protected areas. And Parcel dos Abrolhos, California, also within protected areas, whereas Pedro de Leste, Sebastião Gomes, um, and many of these uh, inner reef, uh, reefs are outside protected areas. Actually, just a small portion of the protected of the reefs are in the protected areas. And uh, there is a lot of uh, discussion uh, concerning the movement of uh, ships and boats in this area. Uh, and as you know, some of our colleagues, they even they sign um, uh, documents that uh, those movements will not uh, affect corals. We have to be very Pay attention for those uh, guys. Uh, so, Thiago Bruce, uh, Professor Thiago Bruce, uh, he did for his PhD a comparison of uh, the coral reefs in, within and outside the protected areas. And uh, what we wanted there was to make a very broad study from the water chemistry dimension to the uh, human output actually human dimension, because this is about humans. We protect this because otherwise people will fish everything. They take fish. They fish everything. And they fish because they have to survive. And some like just to enjoy, just for tourism. So uh, here, there is protection by guards. 
and we, this will be very important for you, for us to understand the difference between uh, Abrolhos Parcel and Timbebas. Timbebas has no police. So we examined the water quality. We did not see differences in the ammonia. No differences. Ammonia concentration is very high. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So these corals, they, they hate uh, aquarium. Some people are trying to grow them in aquarium to test how much they resist uh, oil you know, and uh, other con uh, pollu uh, contaminants. But they don't like aquarium. And uh, it's not only because of ammonia, it's because of dissolved organic matter, DOC, dissolved organic carbon. So within these areas, there is more fish and more corals than outside these areas. This is the first uh, indicators of uh, coral reef systems health. There is much more fish within the protected areas than outside. And much more corals within the protected areas than outside. Around 10% uh, coverage of in a square meter. And uh, around 150 grams per a cubic meter of uh, uh, fish. Of course, fish need uh, cubic meters to live. Right? Uh, Yes, please. Um, 32 years, around 30 years. Yeah, let's, let's be honest. Maybe less, a little bit less. Because one thing is to set up the park, another thing is to enforce law. And you see, uh, there is a clear difference here between Chimbebas and Parcel. Because here there is no police, and here there is police. Here there is no police. There, there is a huge uh, fisherman community in this area, Alca, uh, Alcobaça. And uh, here there is police. On the other hand, in the um, unprotected areas, there is much more algae and turf, algae, algae cover. And uh, algae, so, so much algae. And guess what? This algae could be affecting the, the corals. Do you have an idea? Yes? No? You? Do you know algae? Algae? Yeah. No? Yes? Yes. Uh, what do you think about uh, algae? How the algae could affect uh, the corals? What is one of the major uh, products of photosynthesis? Biomass? Yes, for sure. What else? Oxygen and uh, DOC, dissolved organic carbon. Yes, dissolved organic carbon. Plenty of uh, labile sugar. And uh, some types of bacteria love sugar. Right? And they can grow very rapidly. In the same sites, we counted vibrios. And vibrios, if you give sugar to them, and uh, if you give the right conditions, they grow so fast, they duplicate at, uh, uh, yeah, so they duplicate so fast, right, Wanda? It's like uh, they grow like crazy. Do you have an idea how long does it take for a Vibrio to dub in time? Any of you? Yeah? One minute, two minutes, a hundred minutes. Imagine, uh, so 10 minutes, 10 minutes, around 10 minutes a Vibrio can duplicate. Imagine, that would be great if we could do that. 
So much more vibrious outside the protected areas than inside the protected areas. Possibly relating to the function of the system. And uh, yeah, as I said, there is no water quality difference between the systems, but at the same time, I said there is much more algae outside the protected areas, and the contact of coral and algae is very uh, intimate, and it occurs physically. Physically, we also counted uh, other types of animal, human pathogens, and vibrios in the metagenomes outside and inside the protected areas, and you observe that a trend with an uh, increase of uh, potentially pathogenic bacteria outside the protected areas. This was done by metagenomic analysis of uh, water, very close to the reefs. This water is uh, uh, filtered. The mass of microbes is uh, used as a uh, it to extract DNA, and uh, the total uh, DNA is sequenced, and then we end up with a, a collection of sequences that we identify. Um, just to try to sum up, marine protected areas, they have more fish, more corals, more diversity, less algae, and less pathogenic bacteria, less disease also. So we think that uh, uh, if there is more algae, there is more DOC, more microbes, and more pathogenic microbes, the, the, especially the vibrios, the super heterotrophs. Yes, so I'm coming to, towards uh, half away of uh, what I would like to share with you and discuss with you. I comment in the beginning that uh, the Abrolhos Bank is facing a huge impact by coral disease and massive coral extinction. And uh, what we saw was that uh, there was a big progression of infectious disease in the Abrolhos Bank. We made this forecast that in less than 100 years, Musius milia could, be, could disappear because of the uh, infectious disease, just. And how was this done? Was done by those guys that you saw, diving and others, by counting corals, by measuring disease progression, by in different corals, and uh, measuring the amount of corals per square meters. So, yes, 10 minutes. OK. Less than 10 minutes. OK, I have to run. Uh, thank you. Yes, I am. Yeah, so video survival. So, OK. So, this why we have this uh, in the. You already saw, right? Right. Um, let me run then through what I have uh, to share with you. So microbes are very important in the coral reef system functioning. I'm going to give you two examples, extra two examples. We were here in the uh, Abrolhos, uh, Santa Barbara area, and now we move to these dots here called Buracas. Buracas, a new reef structure discovered by our team of researchers, researchers from Paraíba, from Vitória, São Paulo, Rio de Janeiro. It's a massive group of researchers. So these guys, they found these holes. These holes, they have up to 50 meters depth in the crust. The, the, in general, the depth here of the water column is 50 meters, 50 meters. 
So the guys come inside the buracas, which are 50 meters diameter and 50 meters depth, and they collect water, they measure fish, they film fish, count fish and other organisms. Uh, so why this was discovered, the buracas? Because, because there is much more fish, and men like fish. So men go after fish. Basically, it's, it's as simple as that. And Buracas has so much more fish than the surroundings. But why there is so much fish? Do you have an idea? Do you have an idea? Anderson, or, or his brother. His brother. It, very hard. You have to make a tattoo. Like, uh, so... He, not really, because there is, but yeah, think about fish like also to, to eat, right? Yeah, that's basically there is more food there, there is more nitrogen, nutrients, and there is more bacterial cells, there is more productivity. The, the place functions like a huge fermenter. Sorry, scupa. Yeah, thanks. So, this is this this whole like 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 natural fermenters, um, with full of bacteria, sulfur cycle bacteria, different types of bacteria. Uh, let me move on. These are our facilities. This is 2007, our research vessel. Yeah. Our. Uh, Oceanographic basis and our molecular microbiology lab. Yeah. So that was in 2007. Things moved uh, a long way. Things have improved a lot. I like to share this with you, and I always like to share this with people because the, we Brazilians we don't give up. We have to do it anyway, and we will do it. So we went to this place far away. 200 kilometers with this uh, research vessel. And, um, yeah. My final comments about the role of microbes in the blue Amazon. This, uh, uh, it concerns the mini reefs, the microbes associated with the mini reefs, which are huge microbial biofabrics of uh, calcium carbonate. And more than that, they are housed. They are housed. They are a condo, condominium for marine life. They are condominium. This is the size of the rhodolite bed. This is the biggest rhodolite bed of the world, and it, it was discovered and characterized by our team, people from Rio, from the botanical garden, from uh, UFS, and many others. Uh, this is the size, 21,000 square kilometers. We were here in the Santa Barbara. Rhodolites are this algae. You have seen already this algae, right? They look like rocks. Each one is a reef on its own. You see, there is no sand here because it's just rhodolites over 20,000 square kilometers. It's a huge stock of calcium carbonate, as big as the Great uh, Barrier Coral. And you see the presence of Arthropoda, Chordata, Streptophyta, Nematoda, Cnidaria, Ascomicota, Chlorophyta, Diatoms, and, and Fungi associated with rhodolites. So there is microbes and there is plenty of invertebrates. The microbes are very similar in the different rhodolites. There is no much variation. No much variation. Uh, five minutes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so which types of microbes we find associated with the rhodolites? We find uh, different types of uh, proteobacteria, cyanobacteria in green, and uh, we also find uh, gram-positive bacteria, bacillus, clostridia. Here, a uh, short representation of what we think is going on in the rhodolites. 
é, Calcium Carbonate Formation by Microbes, by Heterotrophs, as a, as a pro, byproduct of the metabolism. Uh, sulfate respiration by the, the sulfobacteria, indicating microaerophilic conditions. Uh, ammonia oxidation by different types of uh, microbes and nitrogen fixation. So, take home message. Some companies, some big companies, they say that these are uh, sediments. Sedimento, terra. There is no life there. Some companies. I, I cannot tell the, no, the name of the company, of course, of the companies, because they, they, they like to prospect there. But we, oceanographers, we like to preserve the environment, right? So be careful. This is a huge place for fertilizing, fertilization of the ocean with larvae, with juveniles of different types of invertebrates, which are crucial for the marine life. We need to promote marine science in Rio de Janeiro. That's critical. It's, it's, we came to a point that is critical. We need to be protagonists of marine science. And how we can do this? We can do this in different levels. We can do this, of course, we can do this in the schools. We can teach the kids, young kids, to become uh, divers oceanographers, biologists, biophysicists, the physicists. We can do this type of activity that uh, Leticia is uh, carrying on together with uh, Paulo Bich and his group, Professor Gazos, uh, Vanda and others. And we have been doing this also. Some of you have attended since uh, 2006 because we realized there is such a, a low level of uh, understanding and appreciation by microbial, marine microbial diversity and uh, functioning. And uh, we have been doing this first in the National Laboratory for Scientific Computing the first two years and now in biology. And uh, this year, uh, between 23 and 27, we organize our eighth uh, workshop, international workshop. Last year, we had people from around the world, many people from the US, students from the US, from Chile, from Europe. And uh, it's a very interesting moment. This is a summary of things that we try to address today many questions. We still have many questions to answer. We are happy to take questions from you. Uh, first, of, but first, I would like to thank the team that does the work, the team of uh, students, PhD students, collaborators from the different institutions, and uh, from north to south of Brazil. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, I could, uh, if time allows, I could take a couple of questions. Thanks. Okay. My question is concerning the metal proteinases that you show uh, to identify it. And do you have um, uh, some information about the structure of these molecules, um, like if uh, is constituted by many domains, metal domains, and there are another domains, and if are there uh, uh, any compounds produced by corals against this activity, these, these molecules? Yeah, so more or less characterized, we know that is uh, uh, metal containing protein. 
yeah and uh, we know that uh, it has affinity for the uh, zooxanthella cells uh, and the uh, coral tissue cells but that yeah sure we have the sequence we have the whole sequence because uh, so we, we sequence the genome of the microbe we are sequenced uh, the, the genome of this microbe and other microbes in order to find uh, the zinc metalloprotease. We have the full sequence. We have, uh, yeah. But we do, did not look at that uh, protein uh, structure modeling yet uh, because of lack of time and, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and cons yeah. So we don't know about the coral, of course. We, it would be interesting to learn more about the coral, if the, the coral can defend itself, for sure. It's an excellent point. The main activities that um, accelerate uh, coral reef uh, degradation in that area in, uh, the major ones are fishing, uh, dredging of the uh, surroundings because there is a huge uh, uh, either way of uh, huge boats with wood that need to go through and uh, in order they, uh, for them to move there the, they have to dredge and remove sediment and um, the sediment is full of microbes and cause anoxia in the microbes. Although some of our colleagues said there is no e e impact on that. There were some uh, uh, so-called studies, consultancy studies that, yeah. So another thing that uh, causes, uh, so the e effect of algae, when you remove fish, the fish that eats algae, algae will proliferate and algae produce a lot of allelopathic compounds, toxins. They produce uh, uh, dissolved organic carbon that can be used as food by bacteria that will infect corals and then it, there will, uh, this uh, loop will be going on. Um, another problem is um, I think our perception about uh, our I think we are just at the surface we don't give the value for what we have that's the point we don't uh, I think we do, we don't look at very far away we look at uh, here at the immediate needs in Brazil that's the major problem and then we screw up with the environments this has been done with the mangroves will be done with the coral reefs there's a narrow mind. Uh, 